Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles, and this is podcast number 86. I have with me Gabriel Contreras, and we are going to do another round of seller financing questions. I've had several investors ask me to go over the trigger word. So a trigger word is something that we're going to hear someone say that gives us an indication that they may want to do something else. So Gabriel, give me, if you can, and up to 10 trigger words that you could hear a seller say that would make you think, hey, I've got a guy or a gal here that's open to seller financing before you've even introduced it to them. So what are the 10 trigger questions or actually the trigger words that causes us to believe that the seller may be interested in seller financing? Correct. That's a great question. Well, first of all, no matter what they say or they don't say, one of the things that we have here is that we always ask for it anyways. But to go and answer your question, some of the trigger uh, words on there uh, is when they have lots of equity. So anytime they mention, you know, I, I, my house, so they'll, you know, words like, I don't owe anything. Uh, you know, they're just so proud of letting you know how much equity in there they have that we can uh, go ahead and take advantage of. Um, when they don't have any equity, well, then that allows us, they're not getting any money anyways, so why not work with what they have on there? So uh, lots of equity, little equity. Some of the big ones are anything that revolves around the word rent. The house is rented. I intend to rent it. I had it rented. Uh, the house is vacant, at uh, least. Anything that involves them having already experienced the receiving monthly payment so if i'm a if i'm a landlord and i say i don't want to deal with this rental i've had it for the last five years that instantly triggers something in your brain that says i've got a seller who i can work seller financing out better than maybe a seller who's not experienced the rental issue right and the reason for that is because they are already accustomed to receiving monthly installments so that just puts them that much closer to being able to say, yes, I've experienced that. I know what that's all about and I'm okay with it. Um, other trigger questions is what are they, you know, it's going to revolve around what are they going to do with this money if and when they get their money. So they talk about putting so that's it in a the question we actually ask in the script, isn't it? It is one of the questions and I actually have a list of other questions on here that I'm going to point out that is incorporated into our script. In fact, our script is designed for that. It's designed to ask the questions and with it, uh, being able to extract those words that we are currently trying to figure out what they are. Uh, sometimes they'll say it and a lot of, but most of the time we cause them to say it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so one of the questions we ask is what, what are you going to be doing with the funds once we buy your house? And if they say, I'm going to buy another house with them, that's probably not a seller that we're going to get very good seller financing terms with. Possibly. Possibly. But if they say, I'm going to stick it at Bank of America for five years, then we know we can offer them a better situation than Bank of America. Very likely. Most likely. In almost every case, that, that, that is true. What are the other questions we ask them in our script that based upon their answer will give a strong indication that they're a finance candidate. Okay. Well, embedded into our script, uh, we already have several questions and those are uh, one of the big ones. Have you considered renting the property? And how does that trigger us to think based upon their answer of yes or no that they're financing? Well, it, give a, it gives us just so much information. Number one, if they've considered renting the property they're also letting us know I don't need that money right now I am okay with receiving monthly payments I'm okay with using this asset as an investment as an income producing asset 
And that's all given to you with that answer. Uh, one of the other questions, is the house rented? Same thing. Uh, is the house rented? Have you considered renting it? Uh, you know, so it, we ask both of those questions, uh, depending on what the answer to the first one. Is it rented? Is it leased? Where, where is it at? Is it leased? Are you accustomed to doing long-term plans for your money and receiving it on a monthly installment? That would be around the word leased. Another question that we have inside of our script is what is going to happen if it doesn't sell? Now tell us why that's a seller trigger answer, seller finance answer. Multiple reasons. Number one, it's going to tell me whether or not they're going to sell it. That's going to be an important one. If somebody says, you know, what's going to happen if it doesn't sell? Oh, it's going to sell. What's going to happen if it doesn't sell? Well, I'm just going to put it on the market. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. They're letting me know they are going to sell the house. They're also letting me know they're not in a hurry to get it, but they're going to go ahead and sell their house. So they're not in a hurry and they are going to sell the house. Very, very uh, important and lots of and good information. Ultimately, if they say, well, if, it does, if, if you don't buy it, I'm just going to rent it out again. Correct. And then that just goes back to, to the, uh, the other questions that we had mentioned on there. So what's going to happen if it doesn't sell? Another important question that's inside of our script is, can you buy your next house without selling this one? That is one of the most important questions we can ask someone when we're looking for opportunities with seller financing. That's a question in disguise. Basically, all I'm asking is, do you need this money? Right. Because if you don't need it, I can, I can tell you how you can make best use of it. Right. And that's what that's about. Uh, more trigger questions, or excuse me, trigger words. Um, you know, when they talk about, I'm going to put it in the bank. I'm going to put it in savings. Uh, I'm going to put it in any sort of an investment. Uh, other ones is uh, um, they're paying debts. So I'm going to use it to pay other debts. Well, then we can go into what's that debt costing you? Why don't I show you how you can receive income greater than money going out? So more money coming in that'll benefit your money going out. Let's go back for a second because I, I, I want to let everybody know. When someone says, what do you plan on doing with the money when you sell this property to me? So we're always throwing that embedded command in there. And they say, I plan on buying another house. I always ask, do you, are you going to use all of the money for the next house? And when do you plan on buying the next house? Yep. Because just because they're saying they're going to buy another house doesn't mean they're going to use it all. And it doesn't mean they're going to go out tomorrow and buy a house. It could be five years down the road. So I always have to ask them, is there any money left over that I can have you sell or finance for me? Which is, I don't ask them that way, but that's where I'm headed. And can I use that money until you find your new house? Right. right. Yeah, you're going to discover that perhaps they only need a portion of that money and thereby allowing you to do some sort of terms with the remaining of it. Right. Really good. Yes. Um, you know, they start talking about, again, more tenants. I don't want to deal with the tenants. I don't want to deal with the hassles of the property. Um, I don't need the money. You know, people brag about that and say, well, I don't need to sell this house and I don't owe a single dollar on it. Well, you know, and I, I've always said, I, I always, and I, I believe this and I'll believe this until the day I can't believe it anymore <clears throat> when they bury me, that if a seller is, has a free and clear house, they have in fact placed a loan on their property at 0% interest. So if that's the case, then since they're already financing it for someone, why can't they just finance it for me? I'm gonna make actually make their position better because I'm gonna give them more than they're currently getting on their zero interest loan that they have in place. That's correct, that's called dead equity. It's just they're doing absolutely nothing for them and we have an opportunity to present them with how to make money on that dead equity. And if, if, if anybody needs money, they don't have it tied up in their house. They would have by then refinanced it if they needed the money. They would have done something different, but they wouldn't have paid off their house if they in fact needed the money. So just having a large equity base in a house tells us we have a seller finance situation. That's correct. Yep. 
anytime they don't have any any plans for it then uh, we can certainly present them with an excellent plan to with what to do with it um, and so those are the main ones those are the main keywords that that will come up and tell you that uh, you know they may be open or at least they are they may be a, a good candidate for it uh, and I'll go back to the very first thing that I said is no matter what they say or don't say we're always going to ask for it anyways. But it, going through our script, we're not asking for it because the Alex and the Ryans are not asking for seller financing. That's tier three negotiation. But the questions we're asking are disguising the true question of seller financing. Is that correct? That is exactly what it is. So when you fall back as a tier three negotiator, you can listen back to the call, which is why these calls being recorded are so important. And you can hear the trigger words and say, ah, we have this one. This one said this, this one said that. Um, give me three examples why it's, it's good for sellers to seller finance in the first place. Okay. Uh, examples of why it's in their best interest. So if the seller said to me, yeah, Mike, that sounds good, but what's in it for me? Why should I do it? I don't know you. I've never met you. Why should I do it? Okay. Well, it's all about going with them with uh, the benefits. What's in it for them? Okay. What are the benefits to them? And prior to that, there's a really huge benefit for us to introduce that question also. And that is the fact that we're now introducing multiple choice offers. Now we're saying I can buy it this way and I can buy it this other way. And either one that they choose is going to work for us so that's very very powerful for us being able to introduce more than one way to buy their house okay uh, but the benefits to the seller is one big one time explain time time that means that we can do it possibly we could do it faster possibly we can work around it possibly we can work around their schedule as to when they need their money or don't need their money yet uh, so time may be speeding it up, slowing it down. You know what? If I retire in a year, I'm going to fall into a different tax bracket. Uh, so if I don't get all the money, but I need some now, I mean, this is being able to dictate when they get their money and the time frame. And I, and I got to interject, guys. I don't know how many times I've heard from a seller. I absolutely want to do seller financing because if I don't, I'm just going to go out and buy a boat. I'm going to go out and buy an RV. I'm going to go out and buy furniture that I don't need. I'd rather have my money making me money than having a chunk of money that I'm just going to go blow on toys. I have heard that over and over and over again. Yes. Yes. I mean, people, people realize that if they have it committed to something that's given them a return, then it's going to be harder for them to be tempted by those toys, by those, by those, uh, uh, you know, waste of money instead of uh, earning more. Right. So give me other reasons why. So you, we, we mentioned because um, it speeds up stuff. It slows down stuff, which you know, the slowing down stuff is important. Some of these folks could have some tax liability if they don't do seller financing. Right. Um, and, you know, just like the homeless guy we bought the house from, I mean, he really wanted seller financing because he wanted that payment. He couldn't carry around 40, 50,000 or 30,000, whatever we gave him in his pocket because he was homeless. Um, I'm, I, I know that we have done seller financing because the property would not qualify to a lender to get lender financing. So they absolutely was in their best option to seller finance it, which was the only way they could sell the property. Right. I didn't even, you know, I, I didn't even think about that one to begin with, but you're right. It may determine whether or not they can actually sell the property. It just very well mean that uh, unless they do it that way, they're just not going to be able to because no lender out there is going to sell or, uh, or allow them to sell the property through, through a traditional sale. And I know we have chatted about this a lot because we've been doing a lot of deals. We use seller financing, the instrument of it, the ability to gain it, to make win-win situations. So we'll have a seller who 
may not be able to get a tenant out of a property, but they want to sell the property. So our option to them is, okay, we'll take it, but you have to finance it for us, right? Yep, we can certainly introduce other, other benefits, uh, you know, more benefits to them if they choose to go that route, if we want them to go that route, we don't always want them to go that route. Right. Uh, because we have no intention of making use of the time, you know, and that's what seller financing is all about, buying ourselves time. Or that's one of the big reasons why we would ask for seller financing is to get ourselves time to do what it is that we're going to do. And we don't always need it. Any other, re any other po um, positives for sellers to go ahead and say yes to seller financing that you can share with us? There's a huge one. Okay. It may mean the difference in the amount of money we can actually pay for it. If they do help us with terms, that may allow us to go ahead and give them a higher purchase price. Because whether we're using our money from our bank account or we're going out and borrowing it from a equity lender or, or anyone else, we have to make, uh, we have to be conscious of the cost of that money, the time that we have it tied up. Even though it's our own money, there's that time value of so, the money. As an example of that, we, we did a deal yesterday where we went out to a private lender who uh, we paid 10 points to. We could have given those 10 points to the seller instead and they would have made more money. That's correct. But they chose, no, we just want to sell our finance. We, don't, we just want to cash it out. So they actually lost that money. Yes. So it can be presented to a seller that it's actually absolutely in their best interest. Money-wise, it's monetarily in their best interest, besides all the other uh, items we talked about, all the other benefits that we talked about. Um, and, and you know, the, the other thing is it, it could eliminate consequences. Uh, one of the big ones is taxes. Uh, another one is, you know, time. So, so, something is coming up. If they sell this, then they need to sell something else. Uh, there's just many different reasons why it's in their best interest to do so. Um, yeah. So at what point, you know, we've got our Alex's and we've got our Ryan's exceptionally um, doing exceptional jobs for us. At what point do you offer a seller, seller finance? And when do you, I think that's one of the big questions investors have is, when do I broach that? When do I bring that topic into the, into the conversation? Now, I know we get contracts and then after contracts, most of the time we're gonna start looking at opportunity there. So we're, it's always important to get a contract first and then see if we can get seller financing second because we're gonna buy the house either way. Correct. But when do you step in? When do you think it's appropriate to step in and say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, let's look at an option for you? Okay. So again, the question is, when do we ask for seller financing? As we already covered, we are, we are actually asking for it throughout the entire script. Another thing I mentioned is we ask for it every time on every offer, on every seller, we're going to be offering it. Um, but the more important one is I don't really like to introduce terms until I've introduced my cash price offer. Okay. And that is because if they take my cash price offer, that means it's good. I'm, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and so buy it now. It's our lowest price property offer. That's correct. So at that point, it's the perfect opportunity to introduce terms first of all you know we're going to present it at equal amounts but introduce the benefits and and especially the the money benefits of not receiving it all now so whether it be points interest payments whatever it is uh, or eliminating costs for them so the benefits so I'm going to introduce the term offer initially by default in the same amount as my cash price Right. But then knowing that I could, because of, I'll be eliminating other costs for ourselves. Right. I know that I'm going to be able to offer them more money to them if they accept that. 
so we sometimes we introduce them if it's very obvious so we're already you know at stage two the Ryan level we can introduce it there okay uh, especially if uh, if we know that the property may not qualify or doesn't qualify for our cash purchase right so that's the probably the times where I introduce seller financing or terms we're calling it terms seller financing is, is, is one of one of the ways um, uh, the terms will encumber seller financing and subject to and the mixture of and so on. Uh, so if I know that I'm not going to be able to pay it our cash price, that could be introduced at the Ryan level. Right. Okay. Absolutely. But I'm talking about, we, as an example, you know, we got one yesterday. I think we got it. It's 190000 value. We got it. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be um, daily deal 10 for everybody that's listening. Um, I think we got it at 115, so we got it at 16 and a half percent of value. Yes, at, at a cash price. So sometimes you're, you're going to step in and and do your due on converting that to seller financing. But what point are you going to do that? Are you going to wait a week? Do you wait two days? Do you wait till the close? Hopefully, we don't wait till close. But when? At what point are you going to introduce that? Well, our system has now showed us that there's the best time to do it. Okay. And we actually have a checklist, okay. and and so now it goes from contract being received to going into verifying our value and condition. Okay, it's going to be important. One, we need to make sure it's the the, the property is worth what we believe it to be worth. Uh, most of the time, we've already done well. Every time, we've already done some preliminary work on that. Anyways, we feel very confident about it, but. We go ahead and go to the next step and have somebody else verify that for us as well. What is that called for everybody that's listening? Well, I'm calling it CMA, which is the Ryan CMA okay. uh, in-house. That's the preliminary where we're doing data sets from seven different sources. Yes. Okay. After that, I involve an outside broker. Okay. And so we call that the, you know, the broker's price opinion. Right. Uh, and that may mean that they'll get me their CMA. Uh, and depending on what the property is and every every situation, I may go ahead and and push more towards a full blown broker's price opinion. The difference between the CMA and the broker's price opinion is actually doing it at their desk versus going to the property, viewing the property, taking pictures, getting me more data to confirm their opinion of the value of it. And in most cases, we pay for that opinion. Sure. So it's, 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 I think it's important for people that are listening to understand that at some point when you get something under contract, you have to start spending money doing your due diligence to verify what you think you know. Right. And this needs to be, you know, Michael, I believe that, you know, one of the bases of our, of our, of our business has always been, it's got to be win-win. Right. And that means win-win, win everybody. Right. Win the, the seller, win us, the buyer, the, all the vendors involved. The, you know the the brokers everybody needs to win so yes the answer is we will pay for that BPO now I'm a California broker and I know you have a real estate license and we will still do this on property that we do our own CMA on right yes I mean so we're not even taking our own opinion we're actually buying an opinion from somebody impartial which folks if you're listening one of the crucial things is to take yourself out of the emotional issue that you may have on buying property because you may think it's great. You may be in love with it. You may be whatever it is, but take yourself out and have someone else tell you what it's worth yep. or, or sometimes not worth. Exactly. Exactly. And, and we've, and we've done that as well. I mean, we've ran with our own opinion, but it's just, Knowing that it's not just your opinion, knowing that it's, you know, that it's very evident that you're right. It just makes it so much better throughout the entire transaction. Um, so we have our BPO and it depends on what, I, what we're going to do with it. Also, Michael, if we're going to be presenting this as an opportunity to someone else, why not get an appraisal? So we're going to spend... I think this is so important to, to discuss for folks, whether you're a seasoned investor, whether you're brand new, whether you're right in the middle, we're getting a BPO that we're paying money on. Once that BPO comes back to us and says, everything you think you know, yes, you're, we're, you're right, we believe. 
Now we're going to go to a professional who's licensed and authorized to do this and pay them more money. That's correct. To get a full bore <clears throat> appraisal. Why do we do that? Because we're now preparing to present opportunity to someone even beyond ourselves. Right. Okay. So if we're going to be offering it, if we're going to be looking into uh, doing a, 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 some kind of a loan from an equity lender, from our, one of our private investors, um, it's just that much more important to be prepared for your presentation, just like we do from the beginning. We got to be prepared to present that that caller that came in for the first time, and we want to be prepared to present it to someone that we are going to try to sell something to, like the idea of funding one of our deals. So and, yes, and so the cost, guys and gals listening, the cost of the BPO and the cost of the appraisal, yes, it's expensive. But it's not nearly as expensive as not doing it and finding yourself in the middle of a deal that just doesn't work. Yep. And sometimes it actually just makes the deal better right. and better and better. As one that we had uh, just a few days ago, we actually put, the co put it under contract based on Ryan's research. Right. Uh, I believe the number was at 70 the BPO, actually, I got involved and then we looked at it and said, hey, should we do this? Okay, I think it's actually worth 80. No, let's get a BPO. BPO came in at 87. And then we got an appraisal. Appraisal comes back in and says, as is, not after repairs, but as is, it's worth 89. Yeah, so, so money well spent. So... Going back to when you ask the seller for, for seller financing, it's when you know you have a deal. And you know you have conditions that the seller has met inside of the conversation that has guided you to believe that seller opportunity, seller financing is an option and an opportunity. Right. Yes. And we were on that question. When do we present it? So, you know, we went off and into the doing the CMAs and the appraisals and all of this. Um, so... The answer is after we do our, 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 our further research, then we're going to come back to them every time right. or just about every time unless we got it from the get go. But we're going to come back to them every time. And there's a couple of reasons for that. With new discovery, we're going to know, wow, the, you know, the price didn't come in or the value didn't come in. Thereby, our cash offer is not going to work. So we're going to have to introduce something different. Um, and now we have more opportunity to get a yes because now we have more information to share with the seller. Another big reason why to introduce it at that point is because now you have a better, longer, more established relationship with this person. We have now called them once, twice, three times, multiple times. We're now, you know, as they say on first name basis, and now I'm able to go in there and say, hey, you know what? You like me. I like you. What do you think about having a long-term relationship? And folks that are listening, that is all about professionalism. And it, is, it, it begins in the very beginning when you have people following scripts. If you tell a seller you're going to call them back on the, a time specific, you call them back. You follow up. You follow up. You follow up. There's never any doubt in the seller's mind that they're dealing with a professional organization. The more you can imp, uh, let them know that, the more that they're going to say yes to seller financing. But if you, if you take a contract and you never talk to them again until like two days before close of escrow, there's no way you're going to get seller financing. None whatsoever. If they have to call you and ask you when you're going to come out and have inspections done, you're not going to get seller finance. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, you've proven yourself unreliable, not right. trusted. You're not doing what you said you were going to do. So what's to let them know that you are going to make that payment and pay them when you're the, when you agreed to. One of the things we do, and it's, I, it's somewhat silent, but it's boy, it's obnoxiously apparent is when we send over our contract, it's the first, one of the first things they see is, 
you can you can actually do seller financing. We don't have that as a they're checked it. We haven't checked it off that they're going to offer a seller financing, but our agreement with them includes paragraphs that they're going to read about seller financing so they can start implementing the thought process on their own. And I think that's a powerful thing. Same way with subject to financing. It's important that we let them know that those are going to be available to them if they want to take advantage of them. They're there. They're on the contract for sure. I want to change course a little bit. Okay. Um, and I don't even know why I want to change course, but I have two. I want to talk about two things real fast. Okay. When do we do a wrap and when do we do an installment sale? Okay. Uh, wrap around mortgage. That's done when uh, we're trying to get seller financing and there's an underlying loan. Right. So it means that they, that they have a loan on there. That's the only that we reason want, why you that would we do want to take sub two, that we want to buy sub two. Well, the wraparound mortgage would mean that we're, they have not agreed to the sub two. Right. So um, that, that's why it has to be wrapped. We're wrapping the underlying. So loan. I'm a seller. I've got an underlying $50,000 mortgage. You've come to me and say, I'm going to give you, I'm going to cash you out at your walk away of 5000 and I want to go ahead and do sub two on the 50. And I say, no, I just met you. I'm not secure with that. I, I'd rather make the payment myself. Right. Then you say to me what? So what, what I'm hearing from you is that you want to be in control of it. And we have a program from that for that. It's the wraparound mortgage. This allows you to be actually in control, receive the payments, and make sure that the underlying loan is paid through you. So it's all about giving the, um, the comfort to the seller right. of knowing it's happening, receiving those funds and knowing that it, the underlying it, loan is however, paid. However, in reality, we're st in, in reality, we're still giving the seller $5,000 walk away money. Correct. And we're not paying off that $50,000. Right. So in, using your numbers, there's an underlying loan for $50,000 and we're agreeing to pay him or the seller uh, an additional $5,000. So the mortgage would be a mortgage for $55,000. And of course, it's just about structuring to where it makes sense. Right. And so that's, that's one way, one reason why we do a wraparound mortgage. Another reason why we might decide to go with a wraparound mortgage versus a subject to and possibly sell or carry back second or something like that. I mean, you can get all kinds of ways. But another reason of why, uh, why we'd want to go wrap around mortgage is because the underlying loan is too ugly. Right. Another yeah. reason why to do wrap it, around mortgage. I know what that means, but explain what that ugliness means. Too ugly. Uh, it may mean most commonly the payment is too high. The house can't afford it. Okay. Um, it may mean that uh, anything to do with the loan itself, uh, maybe it's due here pre uh, pretty soon, maybe it's scheduled wrong, but really it's going to reflect mostly on the payment on the mortgage, uh, on the underlying uh, loan, I should say. So we can take a loan that we don't like because the interest rate is too high. We can orchestrate a wrap with a seller where our payment to the seller isn't sufficient for them to pay the underlying loan and they're paying the difference. That's correct. Do you guys hear that? So you have an ugly loan, you get a seller wrap, they're contributing X dollars per month, of adding to your payment to make that mortgage payment because their loan that they received was so bad in the first place, that's the only way they're gonna be able to sell that house because they can't come to escrow and pay down that mortgage so they're going to pay down that mortgage on a monthly on a monthly wrap yes pretty uncommon i mean it's not the most common thing i'd rather go with a you know uh first choice would be uh subject to the existing loan and make up my difference on the seller carry back second so if i have an eight percent or ten percent first that i'm uh, taking subject to then i will work the rate on their uh second mortgage down to nothing uh, to kind of balance it out. So that's the wrap. Okay. Tell me about when we would say, okay, to an installment sell or a, 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 a performance contract or a land contract or, or contract for deed, those kinds of things. Okay. 
And so, you know, that basically means the buyer needs to do something before the seller is willing to or scheduled to transfer the title. That's all that is. So we don't have what we call constructive notice. There's not a document that's been recorded at the county recorder's office that says the buyer is the owner. There's a document that's unrecorded that the buyer holds or an escrow company can hold that when certain things happen, the deed then will be transferred to the buyer. Correct. So it boils down to basically two, uh, two things, uh, depending on whether you're playing the role of the buyer or the seller. Okay. And it boils down to trust and control. So if you don't trust that they're going to perform, then you hold back the title right. until something happens. And it doesn't have to be uh, a number of installments. It could be, you know, a very common one is, uh, when you put the repair, when you complete the repairs to the house, then I'll give you the deed. In the meantime, you are going to be giving me installment payments uh, until we reach that point. So it could be reached by a time frame. It could be reached by uh, certain that need, uh, something that needs to happen on the part of the seller or the buyer. Right. Uh, but it's going to boil down to either trust and control. So I want to make sure that you... Uh, put that roof on or that you you know are invested into it by so much money and I'm going to control it by not giving you the deed until then and guys and gals don't let someone someone's issue of trust interfere with any emotional issue you may have it's they're not not trusting you they're just not trusting people kind sometimes okay so you could be the most trustworthy, you know, Boy Scout, Girl Scout, Mother Teresa there is out there. They don't know it, so don't let it offend you. If you want to buy houses for profit, we just we can't be offended so easily. So if they need to see some performance on our behalf before they begin to trust us, that's okay. It's, there's nothing wrong with that, so don't let that get in your way. Um, that's not going to. There's enough uh, paper trail where you know you could do just as well as if you had the deed. There's going to be paper trails, going to be processed the same way, and you know, and, and to further talk about that is, it's not usually uh, implemented when we're buying. Right. It's usually implemented when we're selling, right. so that we have that control, right. so that we can build that trust with our buyer. Although, just like you were saying, I'm not going to let that stop me from buying a house. If my seller insists on something like that, because I have no problem with it. Yeah. I mean, we're buying the house. We're getting a bucket load of equity. We're going to turn around, flip it anyway. No big deal. What's the maximum terms will allow a seller to say, I'll sell or finance you, but this is the maximum amount. What's the maximum amount? What's the maximum amount that we will pay? That we will pay at, when a seller says, I'll sell or finance it, but I want... X. Okay. How much can X be at most? That X needs to be answered by each one of us individually. Okay. Okay. Uh, you need to identify what your business model is to begin with. Um, and, and, and so you could say the minimum, minimum amount of money that I will do a deal for is whatever it is. I won't do a deal for less than 15000 I won't do a deal for less than 20000 um, whatever that may be, it's going to be established by you, the, the, the investor. Okay. Uh, so that would be the answer to that. How much is, you know, how, what is the maximum that I will do on terms? If I can get what my business model says I am to receive, then I will do it. As an example, on a cash deal, I don't want to do it any less than $15,000 or 20% of the property value, whatever the, the, the bigger number is. Okay, so now I have to establish my own business model rules. Okay, if I'm gonna do terms, the minimum I'm willing to receive, and taking into consideration now that it's not something that's coming to me now, but I'm gonna have to wait on some of it or all of it, then you need to build your own standards of business of doing business and that may take your 15 cash and on terms my minimum is going to be 20 or 30 whatever that may be 
So, so, so we have a seller who we can buy their house for cash mm -hmm. at 60 cents on the dollar. So cash price, 60 cents on the dollar as is. What's the most all that we can offer him in, in terms for our business model, the way we have our business model set up today, what's the most we could, we could offer that person? I still want to be able to consider cost, closing costs and repairs and stuff like that. Um, but at the very least, we, we definitely, you know, even on cash, it's going to be 20% of the value of the property. Um, in this case, we're looking at every bit of 20, maybe even 30 per $30,000 30, $30, per deal. Um, you know, there's a lot to be involved in that. When am I going to get it? How soon can I get it? Okay. But if I can get twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 out of a deal and I can get it later instead of now. No, no, I'm talking about on our purchase. When we offer seller finance, when we're sell, when a seller's financing it for us, mm -hmm. what's our maximum interest rate? A maximum interest rate? Mm-hmm. Whatever will get me my net amount. Okay. Okay. I mean, if, if, and it's, it's, you know, it's not the easiest thing, but it's, uh, if, if it takes me, um, you know, they're only willing to do it for X amount of time. I'm only willing to do it for five years or 10 years. And I want, I'm chasing $20,000 or $30,000. Okay. If you want it in 10 years, then that calculates out to 6%. If you want it in five years and that calculates out to 2%. So whatever's going to get me that amount of money, I'm going to shorten the period of time. I'm going to lengthen the period of time. I'm going to reduce the interest rate. I'm going to higher the interest rate. It needs to amount that at the end of the day, I'm going to make on a term deal, I'm going to be able to do at least $30,000 if that's your business model. And on a cash deal, I'm okay doing it at $15,000 uh, so, to do right now. So to, to to make this clearer, um, or as clear as possible, folks, let's assume for a second you have a seller that says, I'll seller finance 100% of the property, the purchase. However, I want 100% value. I know without a doubt that if that seller said, and I'll not charge you an interest rate and we'll do a straight payment principal only 15 year mortgage we're going to make money on that property with time so what gabriel's saying is over that 15 year period how much will we have made by utilizing seller financing and you'll find that that's an enormous amount of money so every deal is going to be a little bit different and every investor is going to be different on how much money they want to make per transaction. If that makes any more sense, I mean, more clear, right? Right, right. And, and let's say, for example, you know, because we're not using any numbers here, but let's say, for example, okay, our minimum cash, our minimum amount that we want to net from any deal is going to be 15,000 or 20%. Okay. And if I'm going to do a term, I don't want to do any term deal unless I see thirty thousand dollars out of it okay one way so the, another so the length of the term has to equate to thirty thousand dollars the length of the term or the rate at the end of the day i need to be able to mathematically see i am getting thirty thousand dollars out of this deal okay okay i i hope that makes sense i know this is um advanced financing um last question What if they say no? Maybe they, they just say, Gabe, sounds like you're a great guy and you guys have been real professional. Mm -hmm. And I just want all my money. Okay. What do we do then? If they say no to our terms. Right. Or our term offers. Right. Okay. Well, the immediate answer is we have our cash offer. That they've already accepted. Or not. Okay. I mean, what if they say no to terms? Right. And we haven't agreed to our cash offer. Right. So the answer to what if they say no, number one, let's go back to our cash offer. Mm -hmm. And if they say no to that, then we don't have a deal. And 
there's a lot of them that we do that we don't make deals with. Most of them, as yeah. a matter of fact. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you mean we don't buy every house we make an off we put an offer on? Not. So that's and but we're buying a house a day. So that means we have to have a lot of opportunity out there. That's correct. So what's this business all about? It's about a numbers game. Yeah, it's, it's about numbers, just like any other business. It's a numbers game. And, uh, you know, as we say it over and over and over, is causing those numbers to show up. Right. And that's called marketing. Yeah. Well, this was fun. I hope people understood what um, uh, it'll sell financing a little bit more and the trigger words that you'll hear. Can, can I say more on that last question, Michael? Sure. What do you do when you say no again and you fall back on your cash offer? Uh, and, and I really had to put those in there. Okay. Follow up. Oh, yeah. I, you know, if you guys get here in the other room, now we're in, we're in our own office, but on the outside of this office, we have people out there that are on headsets and computer phones and they're in cubicles and they're live answering. And when they don't have a live answer call to answer, our CRM system says, call this person back on this date. And it, you know, just, it pops up. There it is. Follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow. I don't care what the seller says. Okay, you gotta follow up. Just follow up. Yep. And um, be nice about it, they're a prospect. And even if they say today, I'm not selling today, they will sell someday, so why not follow up? And um, shoot. All industry knows that when someone has an interest, they, from the moment they have interest, there's an amount of time that will lapse before they've solved that interest. Our job is to be there, and we never know when that interest is going to be there. So we better be there when, the, when it is. We've got to follow up and continue to dig for reasons, motivations, look for those same list of words. We've got to figure out what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And then new data, new information, new, new pieces of the puzzle will show up not only for your discovery, but for you being able to construct another way of doing it. Sure. Possibly presenting, when it comes to terms, there's unlimited possibilities of which way you could do it. Right. I mean, you can do present one and another. So dig for some more information, but definitely follow up. And I just had to throw that in there. Great. Thanks, Gabriel. It was fun. Till next time, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.